departure again this morning from our sermon series, Lord Teach Us to Pray. Turning your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 28. The title of the message simply this morning is, Go. And Brother Joe, as he gave a a little bit of an introduction, is... Thank you for that little information that he shared. This morning, if you read Oswald Chambers, his devotional today was The Determination to Serve. So I'm going to read that as a a start as we look into these few verses this morning. It's one of those things that we live in a day and age. We've been watching... Pastor Billy Crone, his series on the end times, every time we watch one of his his sermons, it reminds us that how close we are to the end of what we call today the church age, and the beginning of the seven year tribulation, and all of us as believers that are premillennial believe that we're not going to be part of the tribulation period, and I believe that and I praise God for that but also we need to consider those that in this current day and age do not think that Jesus Christ is any importance the determination to serve which was from by Oswald Chambers this morning said Matthew chapter 20 verse 28 the son of man came not to be served but to serve Jesus also said, Yet I'm among you as one who serves. Paul's idea of service was the same as our Lord's, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. 2 Corinthians 4, 5. We somehow have the idea that a person called to the ministry is called to be different and above other people. But according to Jesus Christ, he is called to be a doormat for others, called to be their spiritual leader, but never their superior. Paul said, Philippians 4.12, I know how to be abased. Paul's idea of service was to pour his life out to the last drop for others. And whether he received praise or blame made no difference. As long as there was one human being who did not know Jesus, Paul felt a debt of service to that person until he did come to know him. But the chief motivation behind Paul's service was not love for others, but love for his Lord. If our devotion is to the cause of humanity, we will be quickly defeated and broken hearted, since we will often be confronted with a great deal of ingratitude from other people. But if we are motivated by our love for God, no amount of ingratitude will be able to hinder us from serving one another. Paul's understanding of how Christ had dealt with him is the secret behind his determination to serve others. I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, 1 Timothy 1.13. In other words, no matter how badly others may have treated Paul, they could never have treated him with the same degree of spite and hatred with which he had treated Jesus Christ. Once we realize that Jesus has served us even to the depths of our meagerness, our selfishness, and our sin... Nothing we encounter from others will be able to exhaust our determination to serve others for his sake. The scripture this morning is, we all know of, is the Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. I'll ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's word this morning. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. And God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. 
if we were to look back at how many times we've read these verses, we've probably read them hundreds, maybe thousands of times. And just a little background that this part of the final instructions given to the 11 apostles just prior to his ascension into heaven after the cross, and this is, this is not the complete story. If you really want the complete story of, of, of his ascension into heaven, you have to go through all the Gospels. And also in the book of Acts. Because Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this. And we've all read this one before. But it says, But ye shall receive power, and after that the Holy Ghost will come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost, uttermost part of the earth. You see, when I consider this is, the BMA calls it World Missions Day. And there's a great work to be done all over the world. The scripture tells us to go all over to the uttermost part of the earth. But sometimes that we are maybe guilty of saying, well, that means we have to go to a foreign country to serve God and share the gospel. Well, news flash: the United States of America is part of the world. And in this, here United States, the gospel needs to be heard. In this part of the country, the Northwest, Oregon, Washington, and California are considered the most unchurched states in the, in, the, in the United States of America, number one and number two being Washington and Oregon. And that's just not my opinion, that's st statistically speaking. And when I look at the BMA's influence here in west of the Mississippi, so to speak, it's, uh, aside from Texas, it's not all that great looking. There's plenty of room for more churches in this part of the country. Now, we're fortunate in this area, in the Rockwood area, there's a lot of different churches. And through a group call, called Shalom Rockwood, I've got to meet some of these pastors in this area and see some of the scope of where they work. And there's a great need. I grew up here. My childhood home is only about 10 minutes away from here. So I grew up here. And I've, I guess you could say I've seen the change. It's not the same when we moved into our house in 1962. Or what it looks like today. So is there a need for the gospel of Jesus Christ in this area? And the answer is absolutely. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 17, you don't have to go there. But I'll just kind of give you, again, a more piece of what's going on. Then the eleven disciples went away to Galilee, into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when he saw him, they worshipped him. But here it is, but some doubted. And then verses 18 through 20. So the first thing this morning that I want to address, number, number one, is the great claim. In verse 18 it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And what Jesus is saying here, he's claiming all power and the right to exercise it. Even though he had that claim to all the power, he used it only as directed by the Heavenly Father. See, we, we know that he's God in the flesh, the God-man. So he has all the attributes of God, but he also had all the attributes of mankind. And time and time again, if you read about the account of, of Jesus' life here on earth, especially when he was in the final three years of his ministry, he was tempted to use the power that he had available. And yet, what did he do? He didn't. He could have, but he didn't. Because he was here to do the will of the Father. You remember, as he was going to the cross, he said, What? Not my will, but thy will be done. And he made this claim in order to commission the apostles to proclaim the gospel throughout the world. And you say, well, that's, that was for the eleven. Is that for us in the church today? And, it ans and the answer to that is, yes, it applies today too. Because we all part are all part as children of God. We're all called to do the same thing that the that 11 apostles were called to do way back then. They knew now what we know today that and we sing songs moment by moment, day by day, and even minute by minute that they 
and that you and I can lean on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? But not only the great claim, but secondly, the great commission. Verse 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. I'm going to stop with that part right there. This first part of the Great Commission, the first part is it says in the first word of verse 19, it says simply, go. And the word that go means what? It implies that an action needs to be taken. And that you and I, as His children, we're to go from this church, from our homes, if we're in the workplace, wherever we are, we're, 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 we're to go with the gift that God has given us. You might think, well, it's, it's, it, it, what it doesn't say is that we need to sit here and wait for them to come. Now, and that doesn't say that do we not need to promote our church? Yes, we do. There's people that come into the church because of what's on the sign there's people that drive there's thousands of cars that drive by this church every day and it might be a saying on the church it might be a prompting of the spirit of God I don't know but people do come in but ultimately we can't depend on just that we can't depend on just a website or a YouTube channel or a Facebook page as we're broadcasting live this morning. Those are all great ways of outreach. But they're not personal. They might show what we do, but it doesn't show who we are because we don't have personal contact with them. And this part of when I consider the Great Commission, the word go, that means we're, we're, we're to go into the highways and byways and, the, and wherever we are to be salt, to be light, to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been given all these valuable tools, but you look back in, in, in the, the day when the Great Commission was given, uh, they didn't have any of that stuff, did they? They didn't have all these other, other means of outreach. Where to go? It's wonderful things that we can support missionaries. That's part of it. We're, we're actually giving them the opportunity to, to go. But that doesn't mean that we are not called to go to. We are called to go to. And I'm not going to give you, it's a, this is what you need to do. This is between you and God. Kind of this morning as we were in our, in our Sunday school time and, and talking about in, in the book of Acts that where the Apostle Paul and his group were, they, they wanted to go a certain way. Do what? Preach the gospel. And the scripture says, but this, this, the Spirit told them, no, you're not going here. No, you're not going here. But then, through a supernatural divine intervention, to go here. And they went. And for you and I, that were, were to be, they were going. They just needed redirection. We need to be going. Be sensitive to the, what the Spirit of God may send us where we're going and say well, why don't you go here today or there's a person over there that you could give them a word this morning our own intellect that's a good thing if we have our, our antennas up but more important we need to have our spiritual antennas up so when God says or the Lord's spirit says go then we can go but then the scripture goes on to say what? It says, Go ye therefore, I mean, excuse me. <clears throat> Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It says, Go ye therefore to what? To teach all nations. You and I as, as children of God, as we go and share the gospel, we're, we're to, first of all, you and I can't save anybody. Someone coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ is strictly the supernatural work of God. But in but in, in order order for us to let, let's just say to share the gospel, it's we're called to I won't use the I'll use the word make disciples. Remember, you and I can't do anything but proclaim the truth. The will of God. 
John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That, that's the will of God. And that, so that sinners can see their lost condition that they're separated from God. A lot of people in the world today don't believe they've done anything wrong. But Romans 3.23 3, clearly says what? For all have sinned. And the word all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes everybody. One of our challenges is today is to, to see or allow God to show people they're guilty. Because they're guilty of what? They're guilty of what Romans 3.23 says, their punishment. Or 6.23, their punishment. The wages of sin is death. That is what every human being on this planet deserves. That's what we've earned. That's our wages. But then it goes on to say, well, that, that may be what you've earned. But what does the rest of that verse say? Hmm. Can anybody say it out? Yes. <clears throat> the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then God's plan of redemption Romans 5 8 says what? But God commended or commanded or demonstrated of his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And ultimately it's the work of the Spirit of God working in a stone cold hard heart to make it soft, pliable to receive the gift. And the gift is received in Romans chapter 10. So this morning, I've always been accused of, well, you just don't read it all, Pastor. So this morning, we're going to read it all. Go to Romans chapter 10 for just a moment. <clears throat> we're going to read together, or not together. I'm going to read verses 9 through 13. So you get the whole picture. Starting in verse 9, it says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. In verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's just that simple. But then it goes on to say, and it, it says, of all nations, of all nations. So we're to go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teaching is making disciples, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone who comes our way. Sometimes that we, 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 we uh, what's a good word? We, we look at people and go, uh, do they need Jesus? Do they need Jesus? Or... I'm not talking to that person. Or, ah, they, 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 they. We, we do assessments in our own mind. We kind of uh, look at people and determine whether they need Jesus or not. You know? when, it, when it says all nations, all people, it's wherever God is leading you. If God is working in here and he's saying, open your mouth and say something, then open your mouth and say something. May it be a kind word, a hand out, maybe a little bit of encouragement. You just never know what your words are going to do unless, but you have to do what? You have to say them. You have to actually open your mouth and say a word or two. And then the scripture goes on to say, baptizing them. Baptizing them doesn't mean saving them. Baptism doesn't save. It might be a shock, but baptism doesn't save. The only thing that happens in a baptism and that baptismal over there is you get wet. But baptism is a sign and a seal of righteousness of Christ accepted by faith. Back to Romans chapter 10 verse 9. It is an outward expression of what has already happened on the inside. And then it says there, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. If you were to think about for the, that for just a moment, without the triune attributes of God working together, you couldn't get saved. 
you couldn't get saved. The Bible tells us that one cannot come to the Lord Jesus Christ unless he is what? He is drawn. He is drawn by God the Father. We have the penalty that was paid, Jesus Christ. You could, you could preach the cross as much as you wanted, but if there wasn't the third part of the triune God, Spirit of God, nothing would happen. That's why you, when you baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, you're acknowledging that the triune God, three distinct persons, all had to work together for you to come to know, their, to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, for me to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you think about it, if any one of those three pieces are missing, you don't stand a chance. Because if God didn't woo you, if Jesus Christ didn't do what he did on the cross and the Spirit didn't speak to your heart, you'd never get it. But as a child of God, that means you've gotten it. You've got to experience all three persons of God, the Trinity. And then it goes on to say, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Teaching them. Once a person comes to know the Lord, they're on a new journey. It's a new journey that lies ahead. There's reading the Word of God. There's memorizing the Word of God. There's serving God. There's being witness bearers, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. All these things, come, you have a new road map to follow. And you and I as children of God are to Help them along the way. Not drag them behind you and say, this is what you're going to do and I'm just keep... You're going to show them by example and then you have to let them loose. Let them loose. When I was discipled, you each have a story, but when I was discipled, things were said to me that this is just a suggestion. I want you to consider I want you to be praying about this. It was never, uh, this is your next step. No, it never happened. It had to be a, a step or, a, or a, a beam of light that God had to shine so I could follow it. Because I wasn't to follow the man. He was to be an example. But as Paul said, what, follow me as I follow Christ? I had to follow my disciple, Pastor Cru James Cruz, follow him but he also realized that I had to make my own decisions he couldn't make them for me and it was only by teaching by a lifestyle by serving God and observing what he did that God opened a path for me and I'm not one of those I'll just go ahead and step right into it no I was, I was a resistor I'll, I'll do anything but yeah, that's fine for you, but that's not... Eh, I can't do that. But eventually, even with resistance, there's no peace unless you follow and do what God says to do. So all those things are what the Great Commission is all about. But here's... That was all instructions of things that were, where God is going to show us what to do. But here's the greatest thing about the Great Commission... Number three is the great comfort. The last part of verse 20 says what? And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is the assurance from God himself is that he's close to his children, all of his children, all of the time. And if we were to think about any other human being other than think about God and how close He is to you, if you need comfort, He's there. If you need assurance, He's there. If you need peace, He's there. If you need power, He's there. And if you need an answered promise, He'll answer it. Most of us remember 9-11. Even though that was quite a while ago, most of us remember 
And one of the big scenes was what? We'll never forget. And I don't think we ever will forget. I tried to find it, but there was a video that was, that was produced that talked about God's presence in the midst of that horrific disaster. I'm trying to pull pieces up in my mind, but it, it, it described the people that were trapped inside that building and that were not going to get out. And it described all these situations, but in every instance, the voice would always say, I'm here with you. I'm here with you. I'm here with you. And one of the, one of the greatest comforts that you and I can take out of this this morning is the Great Commission is a great thing. And but the fact that you have the absolute guarantee of the comfort of God no matter where you are no matter what situation you're in no matter how deep the hole is or really even how high the mountain is the most dangerous place for a child of God to be is to be high on the mountain why is that? because the fall is a long way down from up there But no matter what you're encountering, you have the comfort of God as a child of God. Now, if you're not a child of God, you don't have any of that. You don't have any comfort. You don't have any assurance. You don't have any peace. You don't have any power. You definitely don't have any promises that are going to be kept because you. The Bible says you can't. A person without Jesus Christ cannot not understand the things of God. Because the Spirit is not present in their heart. But if you're a child of God, the Spirit dwells right here. And you can't kick Him out. He's there. He's going to be there. And there's nothing you can do. There's so many verses in, in the Scriptures that basically tell us, I will ne never leave you nor forsake you. There's no power they can pluck you out of my hands that that kind of comfort in knowing that just knowing that one point alone then this commandment will make more sense because if we have to follow through what the great commission has called us to do it ain't easy it wasn't easy back then and it's definitely not easy today Mankind hasn't grown a lick when it comes to the things of God. Men love darkness rather than light. That was true back then and is still true today. But to go forth in the power of God with a transforming gift of salvation through the, your, the Lord Jesus Christ and then the the comfort that we have because He is with us every step of the way. Back there is a, a map on the wall that shows a picture of the world. And it talks about prayer for the persecuted church. We don't understand how blessed we are because those ones that are on that map, you notice we're probably not on that map. because we're not the ones that fall under the level of persecution that people in other parts of the world do. It's one of the points of World Missions Day is the level of persecution in the world for the, a child of God, it's, it's up there. It's high. And even though we in this country complain and whine and bemoan the fact that, that these things are being taken away, it's nothing compared to what people in other parts of the world have to do just to do what we're doing here. Could that come this way? Absolutely. But as a child of God, and knowing that we have God with us, if it happens, will we survive it? Sure we will. Well, what happens if we lose our lives? What happens if we die because of persecution? What does the Bible say? 
To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. That victory we sang about, the victory in Jesus, that's the victory. It's already been won on the cross and you and I cannot lose. It's called, it's the only only place where you can say it's a win-win situation and that's only for a child of God. It's a win-win situation. Either I get to serve God here in a greater capacity for more time or I get to go home. Either way, fine with me. And for every child of God, you ought to be able to say it's fine with me because I know where I'm going. Amen? This commandment or this commission, whatever you want to call it, it's why we're here. It's why God left us here. To share a gift, the greatest gift that's ever been given to mankind. And if you think about it just for as a closing thought, think about for a minute that if, if the if the gospel, if the gift of Jesus Christ is the most valuable gift you have to offer it, why do we hesitate to, 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 to give it out? Because we don't want someone to reject the gift, right? We want someone to just take it, and, but that's not how the world is going to take it. It goes back to the triune God, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit have to all three be working in that particular person in order for that gift to be received. And unfortunately people don't have a badge on their chest that says I'm open to all three I'll take it. No. All we have to do is hand it out and if they take it they take it if they don't they don't. One of the one of the things that if you're a salesman, there's a <laughs> the 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 saying: some will, some won't. And we and this is not to be mean the attitude. We got to say, so what? If they didn't take it. It's not my problem. It's theirs. And then take it and give it to somebody else. Give it to somebody else. We hand it out enough times, someone's going to take it. So just keep handing it out. Amen. All right, so we're going to close with a, a song that notices I gave her Miss Gail the wrong number again. But this is an accompanying song that says, I surrender some, or, or, or maybe it says, I surrender most. No, it says, I surrender, just like the detergent, A-L-L. If you've gone to Multnomah School of the Bible, you don't walk out of Multnomah with